My dramatic reading of It's All in the Mallows Baby is probably to this date my proudest creation, and yes, I am aware of how sad that opening sentence is, but what kind of person could possibly write it? Uh, if you haven't seen it, go back, watch the video all the way through, right now, you will not be disappointed. But there's no name or any identifiers whatsoever on the paper, not a date, a class, or even a title. To get into what kind of person could write it, we have to get into where I found it. Um, I posted an entire video on the origin of the story, but the short of it is I found it in a basement of an academic building at Lakeland University, which is a small college located in Howard's Grove, Wisconsin. Um, you might ask, what's Lakeland University? What's Howard's Grove, Wisconsin? Exactly. <laughs> Early in the story, the author messes up and writes in Matt instead of the main character's name, Nico. Uh, you could say that this is just because Maddie is drunk and got Nico's name wrong, but there is nobody else in the story named Matt, and I want to think that the author accidentally wrote his own name in for what is very obviously a self-insert character. Uh, there's a signature at the top that doesn't say Matt, but that's the name of the editor, not the author. I believe it says Emily Smith, but I'm not sure, and I couldn't find anyone uh, matching that after searching a couple social media sites. So I guess we'll just call the author Matt, and we'll call the editor Emily. Um, I'm guessing the paper was from some sort of creative writing class. There were several copies and all had some sort of editing marks on them. I'm also operating under the assumption that this was in fact written by a college student. Uh, a friend of mine mentioned that it might have been a middle schooler doing some sort of like class activity or something. Um, but as far as I know, there aren't any summer camps or you know, activities that would involve a writing like this. Um, most of them are athletic camps, you know, soccer, football, volleyball. Music camp's actually the only one that's, like, not an athletic camp. So Matt probably took this class for a gen ed requirement, since creative writing is typically a really easy A, and his, you know, grammar and editing skills don't seem quite up to par with someone taking an English class for an English major. Uh, it also lines up with the idea that he's an underclassman who hasn't exactly experienced being an adult, we will get into that very soon. So a couple things confirm that this guy's from a small town, probably way out in the Wisconsin country. Maybe. Uh, I'm not really sure what like actual real people do for fun, but growing up in a small town in Wisconsin in middle school, uh, a common thing my friends and I would do would be to have a bonfire where we all sit around a janky fire pit and burn things like our... Um, homework, you know, random old flooring, school uniforms, you know, normal stuff. So yeah, it's a common thing to do in like small towns. I don't know if like people in cities that have real friends do stuff like that, but yeah. Another thing, and this is the one that really got me, who the fuck says blue smoothie? I, I have to look that up on Urban Dictionary. It has like one definition from 2007, and uh, apparently it just means bush light, but only rednecks say it which is hilarious. Um, and that brings up the possibility that this guy is actually from a bigger city like Sheboygan, and he just wants to act like a redneck, um, which is, you know, depressingly common. <laughs> I gotta say that that is honestly the most likely explanation. He's a fake redneck from someplace like, I don't know, Fond du Lac or uh, Sheboygan or... Um, Manitowoc and he just wants to be a redneck because people think that's cool for some reason. On that note, I guarantee that Matt is a massive jabroni. Like, when a main character of a story has no discernible traits, it's usually because it's a self-insert where the author projects all the things that they think they are onto the character. So, Nico is very clearly an author self-insert. He's just so cool and has all the friends and he's just so smart and everyone likes him and all the girls want to bang him and he's just so amazing like come on <laughs> seriously within the second paragraph he's already getting the girl who's just immediately dtf but it's also super obvious he's never actually been to a party because like does anyone actually get sloshed on bush light but, like, also, also, this guy can't, can't seem to decide whether this is a small gathering of friends sipping beer around a fire or an actual party. 
Uh, it looks like Billy Jean is the only person he doesn't know. So, like, how the heck does she even show up at his house? And everyone else sitting around the fire is his good friends. Though later he actually mentions a weird couple that apparently he doesn't, also doesn't know. Dry humping in the corner. Which suggests it's like an actual party. And that just makes me think that Matt has never been to either. So, yeah, we can uh, check that out. Our author, Matt, he... Um, one, didn't ha probably the last time he had friends was middle school, and two, he hasn't ever actually been to a social function as an adult, which also lines up with, you know, being at Lakeland. So yeah, Nico's just hanging out with his friends, and then gets blue-balled, and drinks four more beers, and goes to sleep. Um, sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure recording Jeopardy doesn't work like this, and it doesn't really add anything to the story. Matt just wanted his character to be, like, way past smart in addition to being super attractive and having a ton of friends um and you can tell that matt really doesn't care much about the jeopardy plot line because there's like one paragraph where apparently this guy gets his ass kicked at jeopardy and less than half a page later it's the next day well <sighs> the next page just gets fucking weird and it's where I've speculated about the particular prompt that this assignment evolved like was it something having to do with supernatural stuff or, like, having... I don't know. Was it about an author self-insert? My best guess was that it was something having to do with an extended metaphor. Writing an extended metaphor, which is the marshmallow with this story. Something about cooking a marshmallow slowly, like, with forming relationships and also Jeopardy. Uh, maybe he had to slow down and not drink a ton of blue smoothies and... Uh, not go for the first girl he saw. I I never said it was a good extended metaphor. Like, wouldn't he burn the marshmallow with a one-night stand and, like, slowly roast a perfect golden brown Milo with a childhood friend? See, this is what I mean. The more you analyze this piece of, quote, literature, the dumber it gets. Um, personally, I think he fucked up the extended metaphor because he was rejected in real life by an actual female friend, which... I can't figure out is more funny or sad. I'm leaning towards funny because I am done nothing but laugh at Matt for like, how long is this recording? Eight minutes. <laughs> Either way, this is this story is Matt's way of making himself feel better about messing up his sad, sad life, which honestly, kind of relatable. Wish you did it in a way that didn't suck. Um, you know, maybe, 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 maybe the prompt was uh making an unreliable or unlikable protagonist like Nico. Um, and, you know, Matt definitely succeeded at that. Uh, so the next section of the story, just, just it just goes off the fucking rails. Like, seriously, the, enti the entire next paragraph is just so fucking stupid. And it's also the longest one in the story. Like, Matt was actually trying here. So, um... So, this is how it goes. So, Matt, I mean, Nico, Nico is feeling bad about himself. You know, Captain Blue Balls and Sad Boy Nico Mode and all that. So, he decides to time travel with the power of Lucky Charms and farting. Like, that that was the moment um, in sectionals that we all got to. And we we're like, what the fuck is going on? And... <laughs> I also, I really can't for the life of me figure out what he means by running the table. Um, it means a winning streak in college football, pool, or beer pong. Like, does he mean that he beat Maddie in a drinking game so much that she got mega sloshed on blue smoothies and couldn't do the sex? Because that's all the girls in the story are to Matt, sex objects. So if run the table means he won beer pong too many times against Maddie, that means the only reason Nico didn't get laid the first time around, it, it's, it's because he was just so good at beer pong that he, uh, his hookup got too sloshed to get laid. Like, if that's the case, how goddamn conceited is this guy? <laughs> that's just so funny to me. Like, the only t reason he couldn't get laid is because he's just too good at beer pong <laughs> even though beer pong's not actually mentioned and you kind of just have to it's yeah you have to guess what run the table means 
even though beer pong isn't typically something that you do at like a small gathering of friends at a bonfire, who knows? Um, oh, right. So Matt's traveled. Ba- uh, ne- sorry, Nico has traveled back in time. His only goal is to get laid, so he immediately goes after the other girl, who's either named after a Michael Jackson song or getting your penis sucked. And I'll let you decide which one it was. Yeah. I'm so disappointed in this writing. <laughs> we don't we don't even know anything about BJ besides that she cooks her marshmallow like a normal person, but like I guess that's all she needs to hop on Nico's wiener after meeting him for the first time tonight. <laughs> okay. Time for a fun aside on the super inconsistent slang in this story. Like, okay, he uses run the table super wrong and also says full cupped, which full cup is a sensor of fuck up, but saying full cupped doesn't make sense with the sensor. Like, fuck upped is not a thing. And else, and anyway, he says fuck later in the paragraph. Anyways, God, this writing is dumb. <laughs> I'm having way too much fun with this shit. And he uses really weird niche hick slang, like blue smoothie, but none of the rest of the dialogue or characters um, or even setting besides the fact that it's a bonfire makes me think that it's taking place in the country, which again tells me that this guy is a fake redneck. (laughs) The use of the word beezy is especially weird. Obviously in this context, it just refers to weed. But um, most definitions I found says it's a derogatory term for a woman. Like on Urban Dictionary, you have to go like two pages in before it says that BZ just means blunt. Uh, Maybe this is just a coincidence and he's not aware. Matt's not aware of the double meaning, especially since it's Billie Jean saying BZ and not Nico. But, you know, maybe Matt has a grudge against women or something after getting rejected by the real life Maddie. And also every other girl in Howard's Grove. Uh, He uses a couple words to describe weed, like beezy and ganja and missile of cannabis. Like, (sighs) It's so disappointing. Honestly, I think Matt just looked up every way to say marijuana on Urban Dictionary and put his favorites in just to sound mature, with no concern as to whether it was consistent or not for the character. Again, supporting my theory that he's a city boy pretending to be uh, edgy. (laughs) All right, let's move on. The fourth page, definitely my favorite because it shows just how much of a massive virgin Matt is. Um, I mean, I guess Alexa Play Music got a genuine chuckle out of me, but like, just, I can't even. Play the, play the frickin' clip. Shut up, Maddie, I said, and turned to Billie Jean, who was also in the same spot as before, slowly cooking up her mellow. Can you teach me how to get that sweet golden brown color, BJ? I asked her gently. Of course, baby. Only if you rip this beezy and get food with me. She smiled so innocently, but the little bit of crazy in her eyes piqued my interest. I, of course, agreed to enjoy the fragrant missile of cannabis that was neatly tucked into her bra strap. Panda Express filled our bellies as we fell onto the couch back at home. Even with all the food and ganja, we still couldn't sleep. Alexa, play music, I shouted. The music started out really low, but I already knew what song it was because it was my favorite. A few seconds later, as the volume picked up, Billie Jean grabbed me and said, I love this song. Me too, I yelled back, giving her a flirtatious smirk. And things just happened from there. There wasn't a piece of furniture in that living room that we didn't touch. Our young bodies in peak sexual condition rinsed that room of any purity and dignity it had. A couple albums later, just like that, we all of a sudden felt really sleepy. Jesus Christ, puberty hit my voice hard over the past year, huh? Okay, so like, where do I even fucking start with this shit? Pay attention to the line. She smiled so innocently, but that little bit of crazy in her eyes piqued my interest. Like, that's a really specific character trait. Um, for this character of BJ to have, especially because it's the only character trait that she has, uh, besides the whole marshmallow roasting thing. So I want to say that I think that Matt is a weeb because like, that's the stereotypical innocent, but also crazy 
uh, yandere trait that apparently people have a fetish for. I don't make the rules, but uh, if that's true, then man, this guy just got even sadder. Um, our young bodies in peak sexual condition rinse that room of any purity and dignity and had. That's a real sentence written by a real adult. Just like, let that sink in for a moment. A real person wrote that. <laughs> also, the fact that he says fragrant missile of cannabis tucked neatly into her bra strap tells me that one, he, this guy has never smoked weed, and two, this guy has never seen a woman naked in real life. Like, this guy absolutely exudes virginity. Uh, personally, I'm of the opinion that virginity is a social construct and it really doesn't matter like who, when, you lose your virginity. It's not super important, but god damn. When you see, a, when you see something like this, uh, y you can't just help but think that this is what zero bitches does to someone. <laughs> Alright, so Nico and Blowjob bang for a couple albums. That's exactly what someone who doesn't know how sex works says. I think with all all of the writing sins in this story, the sex scene is by far the worst. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, then up next in a very brief paragraph, Matt just goes, oh yeah, also I won Jeopardy Teehee. Obviously, the sex part is the most important to Matt. Uh, obviously. So... The next day, Nico slash Matt is congratulated by all his awesome friends. And BJ the Beezy brings him a fat plate of pancakes, because of course she does. Uh, Nico's childhood friend, Maddie, doesn't even show up here because she didn't have sex with him and is therefore unimportant as a person. Or, sorry, women aren't people to Matt. Unfortunately... This guy has to go back to his sad life at Lakeland College where he doesn't have friends and nobody wants to bang him and he can't even spell peaked correctly. Uh, Emily says Matt should work on voice and realistic dialogue, which, you know, I guess it's a good start, but god damn, this shit needs way more work than just that. <sighs> so, yeah, that's, that's my analysis. I'm probably, like, way off with this and Matt maybe isn't even this kind of person maybe everything in this story was intentional and was supposed to give the impression that the author was a sad sad man uh, who freaking knows there are also a couple more things that are just a little weird about this story um, it was the only one that we found in the room like if it was part of a set of stuff written for a class it should have been with other assignments or maybe other people's things but it was the only one there. Uh, it was also in like a computer lab room, like a study room, or maybe it was a storage room during the semester. Uh, it wasn't a classroom. It was adjacent to the classroom and probably where professors kept all their things or something. I don't know. Um, my guess as to why it's the only one that we found is I think Matt probably skipped class that day and didn't get his peer edits. And the professor just never bothered to give it back because he hardly ever showed up to class anyways. You know, that sounds like the kind of thing Matt would do, skipping class to, I don't know, drink blue smoothies in a cornfield. <laughs> There's no date, name, professor, assignment, any identifiers. So was I'm guessing that the peer editing was just anonymous um, and so students didn't know whose story they were editing. But also Emily signed the top of it. I don't get it. Um, so, I'd really like to get the real story, the real Matt. And Matt, if you're out there, hit me up. <laughs>